Since Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition was supposed to be a fresh new game, Wizards of the Coast set up a contest to allow a bunch of freelancers to submit ideas for a fresh new campaign setting. A dude called Keith Baker sent them a Baron and won. Unlike the Forgotten Realms, which is known for its distorted canon. Baron's timeline will never progress and none of the novels are considered setting canon. This is a welcome change due to the ridiculousness that ensued due to the Drizzt novels among others, and allows the PCS to influence things without mucking up canon. The one exception was the 4 adaptation, which considered progressing the setting by a few years, but fan uproar prior to the book's release led to the timeline being kept the same. The setting tries to steer away or at least subvert many of the D&D and fantasy in general stereotypes. It features dinosaur riding halflings, jungle dwelling drow who look like saints compared to their other counterparts, non-evil monster races, a fantasy equivalent of World War I, magic power trains and a more pulp, Indiana Jones-esque approach to high fantasy adventuring. It also focuses heavily on intrigue, which is usually based around either the nations that survived the last war or the dragon marked houses. The last war was initially caused by a succession dispute that eventually erupted into a century-long conflict which devastated the continent, broke up the kingdom of Galifa and obliterated the kingdom of Sire. The Dragon Marked Houses are organizations that control various aspects of life in Iberon due to the magical nature of the specific Dragon Mark that manifests on an individual. The most advanced tech is powered by enslaved elementals, like that airship. Iberon is a generally very human setting, where low-level magic is ubiquitous, cheap, and readily used by the world's inhabitants to make their lives better wide magic. This allows for some more modern style adventures without tying too much to the pseudo-medievalism D&D is known for, investigating a murder in a train, a war between gangs in a city, exploring a jungle temple Indiana Jones style and fighting skeletons in an ancient tomb made by a lich all can coexist with coherence. One popular change instituted by Baron is a relaxed approach to alignment. Clerics of good gods can be evil and vice versa, opening up tons of fresh storytelling opportunities that would normally be restricted by the nature of the system, like corrupt or misguided clerics of good deities turning benevolent faiths to evil ends, or deluded followers of evil scam cults being all bright-eyed and idealistic about the religion they were born into. Racial alignments by and large do not exist, from orcs to goblins to gnolls. All the monster races have actual cultures and shit rather than just being blood bags full of XP for PCS to murder, and while lots of them are evil, just as many aren't similar to their human counterparts. In Ibaran, gods and religion function much differently than the typical D&D take. While settings like Greyhawk and the Forgotten Realms have gods that objectively exist and the only question is if you worship them or not. Iberon has no traditional gods that are proven to exist. People's religion is a matter of faith. Divine magic doesn't work because gods grant spells, it comes from the caster's faith or some other mechanism. While there are religions that worship entities or concepts that objectively exist, they aren't gods in the D&D sense, they could be demons, or a force used to combat said demons like the silver flame Karlok Shash. Some religions even deny that gods exist, or if they did they wouldn't be worth worshipping because of how shitty the world is like the seekers of the divinity within. Akka the blood of Vol. Others don't even concern themselves with that stuff. Most elves worship their ancestors and try to make their greatest heroes immortal, whether by making them positive undead powered by devotion like the Undying Court. Traditional negative undead. Vampires. Liches, Death Knights, ETC, like the now extinct line of Vol, separate from the blood of Vol, or just honoring their memory like the Valina. The religions that do believe in more traditional gods have no proof they exist. It's just a matter of faith just like the real world. Even those duped by religions the setting books explicitly confirm our scams can produce divine casters. This take on religion was a big selling point when the setting came out and is still a well liked aspect. Unlike most settings, Iberon has no East Asia analogue. One may have existed on Salona. It was large enough to have spawned a variety of human races 
but it had have long since fallen to the quarry and been absorbed into Redra. Instead Asian mechanics come from a variety of sources. Dwarfs invented the concept of samurai and katana, while elves created ninja, and shujenja are dragon worshippers while nobody knows where the tradition of wujen began. A character's nationality is far more important in a baron than in other settings. In Toral someone from Am will not have significantly different reactions or experiences than someone from the city-states that make up the Lord's Alliance. In a baron however, a human from Berlin will have substantially differing views than one from Onda, Thrain, Kenneth or the Ruins of Sire, let alone Stormreach or Saluna. This is more important than race to most people. So in a baron a dwarf from Thrain doesn't hate a Kenneth elf because he's an elf. He hates him because the elf is from a land where the dead walk. That's ruled by absolute monarchy who's been fighting with his homeland for the better part of a century with a state religion based on a blasphemous claim that men can become gods instead of the only religion that's provably true. TLDR. Halflings on dinosaurs. Pulpy action. Fantasy Indiana Jones. Politics. Lots of awesome. The birth setting of the shifter. The changeling. The Kalashta. And. Most famously, the Warforged PC races. History. Age of Dragons. Basically, in the dawn of time, there were three great progenitor dragons. Sibiris, good and or celestial. A baron, neutral and or natural. And Kyber, evil and or fiendish. They either created or discovered a prophecy, which is a cosmic force that seems to equate to destiny and fate. The dragons fought over the prophecy which shattered both it and the world. Sibiris was broken into a thousand pieces in orbit around the world. Kyber was bound into the depths of the Underdark, and a baron merged with the physical world to heal it. In the process of this, each of the dragons basically materialized as crystalline fragments that are harvested and used to empower certain magic items and effects from their godlike positions in the cosmos. They also create living beings. Sibiris creates the dragon races, which includes the cow apples. A baron creates most of the bulk of the other beings, beasts, humanoids, etc. Kyber creates fiends, most notably the Rakshasas. Age of Demons. The fiends basically overrun the world about 10 million years back and create a hell on earth where they keep dragons and other beings subjugated. After about 8 million years, the dragons finally rediscover the prophecy, which gives them the drive to resist the fiends. The other common races basically cower at the magical Armageddon happening. In a truly legendary effort, the Kowatls use powerful magic to permanently bind the most powerful demon lords and other fiends down to Kyber. Trapped by the crystalline fragments of that ancient dragon, the dragons mourn the loss of their allies and withdraw to Argonison to contemplate the mysteries of the prophecy, leaving the world open to everyone else. Age of Giants With the dragons and fiends both gone, the giant races of the continent called Zendrik rise up and start establishing their own civilization. This is a pretty crazy time of the world, lasting for 40,000 years or so, with the giants creating this vast empire where they enslave elves, and created the drought to hunt down escaped slaves. Technically they created all elves from Eladrin according to 4th edition but nobody liked that fee wild bullshit so it's back to just them creating the drow. The giants previously learned magic at the feet, claws, of the dragons, and pass some of that knowledge down to the elves drow so they can do the busy work of spellcasting. But they hold back some of the big magic so the elves can't get strong enough to free themselves. Things are great for a while and the giants create some amazing shit including new types of magic items, schema, and even new kinds of magic, artifact spells, plus it is heavily implied that it was giants who discovered and all perfected artificer magic on their own. In comparison, the ancient giants of Aberon were basically like the netheries of Forgotten Realms, building floating structures, flying ships, and other vast artifact level shit using techniques unknown to modern spill casters. And then they started exploring other planes and it all went to fuck when they breached into Dalkor, the plane of dreams. That plane, you see, has thousands year cycles where it switches between light and dark phases where the inhabitants are either good or evil, 
respectively, and when the cycle turns, every inhabitant basically dies and is reborn without any knowledge of the past cycle. It was, at the time the giants invaded, about to change phase, and the inhabitants, the precursors to today's quarry, had no intention whatsoever of fucking dying. They attempted to flee to Ibaran as peaceful refugees, but the aggressive natives botched first contact, so the giants had a war on their hands. By all evidence in the game, the giant Cory war was the first use of magic as a form of mass destruction by the lesser, Akanon dragon, races. The Cory actually created the first war forged in this era as mass-produced mindless constructs used to act as foot soldiers. Based on the existence of the psionic war forged, Akasa forged, it is also very possible that the Kori were attempting to create something that their spirits could possess, in order to anchor to Iberon and ride out the destruction cycle of Dalkor. The giants, whose magic was not quite powerful enough to completely and totally guard their minds and spirits as they slept, saw themselves fighting a losing battle against the equivalent of a kind of eldritch horror from an alien plane of existence. In desperation to close the bridge between Baron and Alcor, the giants decided to do something creative. Using, literally, earth-shattering powers, they actually kicked Dalcor out of its planar orbit, causing it to float off into the astral plane and be more or less lost. Unfortunately, if you're thinking that wouldn't destabilizing the multiverse have cataclysmic results, you'll be correct. The power the giants unleashed shattered their continent. Huge sections slid off into the sea, manifest zones, areas where other random planes seep into the material plane, sprung up spreading chaos in their wake, and basically they unleashed an arcane Armageddon upon their empire. Hell. One of their cities became well, hell without demons. Remember all those enslaved elves who also knew some magic they decided this was their best chance to rebel against the giants. The giants, naturally, decided fuck it and started up more magic to basically do total genocide upon the elven race. The dragons, already pissed as hell about the giants actually tearing the planescape apart and having no regard for either their own, the dragons, or Iberon's safety decided enough was enough. Essentially, every dragon in Argonison took to the skies and as a race, dragonkind rained all their destructive power down on Zendrik. Let's stop a second and think about that. This includes all the ancient ass dragons with access to epic spells. As in, the kind you make from the 3.0 epic level handbook. The ones that can do impossible shit like the netheries in Forgotten Realms used to do such as shearing off mountain tops to make them into flying cities. The dragons basically added to the already terrible cataclysm the giants did to themselves by throwing down a lot more destruction and stuff. The shattered plan escape, the elven rebellion, and the dragon's wrath basically spent 1000 years turning the world's greatest magical empire into a bunch of broken, forgotten ruins. Aside from the strange, twisted landscape of Zendrig itself, which makes the Amazon, the Sahara, and Siberia all look like a bunch of national parks by comparison. There are two main after effects of the cataclysm. The first is the Traveler's Curse, which causes a slight warping of space and or time when traveling the continent. It gets less bad if you know where you're going, or have someone who knows where they are going lead you there but otherwise it's a real crapshoot whether or not you get somewhere quickly and accurately, or stumble into the hands of a drow tribe who enjoys having you for dinner. Get it? The second effect is Durash Kotal, or the madness of crowds, which says that if any settlement reaches a certain size or sophistication, the entire population is gripped with homicidal rage and starts killing until they die. There's evidence this is true. But there's also questions about how Stormreach has resisted this effect despite growing in size. The Age of Monsters After the giants get their collective dicks kicked, the goblinoid kingdoms on Corvair start rising up. They build up the Dakani Empire, named for the goblinoid that united the six kingdoms. And while the orcs do rise up in the western areas of the Shadow Marches, they never really threaten the united goblins. Keep in mind, alignment is slippery in this setting. Goblins and bugbears aren't automatically evil or even frequently chaotic here. In fact the goblinoids of Iberon tend towards law. Things are okay with them until they deal with another type of eldritch horror monster. The deal kit.
who created pretty most of the aberrations in the setting. And if their herald brought fear, imagine if you can the terror, the blind, unreasoning panic that now rips through a barren. A million and more eyes look upon they who are Diokit, and for each race the vision differs, and each mind that views them struggles as best it can to perceive that unguessable species in a form it can comprehend. The goblins try hard, but lack the knowledge of how to actually fight these things. So after the Dealaki war cripples their empire, it falls apart as various tribes squabble over controlling the remains. So why wasn't the world overrun with horrific aberrations and madness well? Those orcs off to the west, they had some druids called gatekeepers who knew this shit was about to happen. So they prepared accordingly and marched off in a small bands, not unlike some Warhammer witch hunters, to attack, defeat and seal up the aberrations behind a bunch of mystical seals and stuff. That's right, boys and girls, the orcs fucking saved a baron from the evil horrors. Nothing like lamp shading tropes. How they didn't even try to make much of it, they just fucked off back to the shadow marches, where they live quietly waiting for signs of Dealki shit getting free again. The baron orcs are good folks. While all this was happening, the dragons got a burr up their ass and started attacking the elves of Erinal. But here's the weird part, they didn't actually try to destroy them. Not totally like they did the giants. This has been happening for, more or less, about 26,000 years. The elves know the dragons could rightly snuff them out of existence, but why the dragons don't do it is one of the many mysteries of the setting. In the meantime, the elves built up a fucking strange culture that looks like a mixture of traditional D&D elven and no shit Aztec and can level stuff. The elves don't use necromancy, but instead create beings called the undying. Instead of negative energy that sustains undead, they use positive energy to force life into their withered bodies, creating a type of creature called the Deathless. First seen in the book of Exalted Deeds. It's a bit of a strange thing for both DMS and players to wrap their heads around, but it certainly adds a truly unique cultural touch to the game setting. Oh, also, Erinal grows all kinds of weird ass plants, including this unique type of tree called sword that is actually buoyant in air, something that will become vitally important a few millennia later. Oh, and the dwarfs migrate from the frostful up north down to the Iron Root Mountains, exile some barbarian dwarfs to the surface, setting up their little shop while the civilized dwarfs promptly get eaten by the deal kick, but they don't become important for a while. At this point, they're kind of like Conan the Barbarian types, only shorter and beardy. The Kingdom of Galifa. Just over 3000 years before the official start of the Baron campaign, various races starting being born with mystical tattoos on their bodies, giving them access to strange powers depending on the complexity of the tattoo. These dragon marks were called that because the dragons who actually spoke to lesser beings about them said they were a manifestation of the prophecy that they obsess about. However, one of the dragon marks, the mark of death is wiped out because an elf and a dragon made sweet, sweet love and produce a half dragon with the mark, which was considered a total abomination. That's right, kids, all you dragon kin types who think it would be so cool to be a half dragon in D&D best keep that shit to yourself in a barren. You are a living insult to the purity of dragons and the prophecy. And, apparently, elves if that's your other parent and you will be ethnically cleansed from the world. This isn't a joke, it's part of the setting. Certain other draconic races may or may not be treated similarly. Kobolds are basically the same, though they come in three breeds based on Sibiris, a Baron, and Kaiba that only other kobolds can tell the difference of, and spell scales are seen with confusion and annoyance. They are basically a kind of mutation found mostly among arcane practitioners who have kids, but half dragons are basically a big no-no. Dragonborn of Bahamut are okay, though the dragons do grumble that Bahamut doesn't really need their kind running around. The template is still used, but it's for things like the fiendish blessing of Shyamut than literal half-breeds. Anyway, while this drag mark shit is happening, this chick named Lhaza leads a shitload of refugees and or colonists from Salona to Corvair. Lhaza first lands in a bunch of eastern islands which will collectively be named after her one day, and humans start spreading out. Fast forward a thousand years, 
and this human named Khan Ken the Conqueror goes out, kicks nine kinds of goblin ass, and created the nation of Kenneth, making him a much more ambitious sort than Conan. I mean, I love that goofy Samirian, but he did dawdle a bit on becoming king. Kern went out and got shit done. Kern tries to conquer everyone else, but they aren't having his shit, so he fucks off back to Kenneth. But his efforts do basically establish dozens of human city-states and nations around the continent. So there's that. A thousand years after, a guy named Gallifer is born, and at the ripe age of 45 has taken control of the five nations and established a kingdom in his name. His kids each get control of a single nation. This is basically the golden age for humanity, because under Gallifer, magic is used not just as a weapon but a kind of utility. The dragon marked houses start to realize they can create magic items that really do stuff like empower vehicles to travel faster, or send messages instantly, or whatever. Keith Baker keeps saying this isn't a magi tech society, what he means by that is it isn't the final fantasy style of things. They're using magic to do things in the real world we did with mechanical chemical technology, instead of mashing magic and technology together haphazardly. Stuff like a stone that casts prestidigitation to clean shit functions like a laundromat would in the real world but it's a magical solution to the issue. Or using weather control spells to make boats go real fast. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for coom jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and DND 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. The Last War. The sad part is, the last war started about 900 years after the kingdom of Galifor was created. When King Jared died, three of his five kids rejected the ascension of Miss Han, Jared's eldest daughter and ruler of Sire which was basically the most magi tech nation of that time. They all fuck off back to their nations and start agitating for war, which lasts 100 years. No, not constant actual battles that would have rightly ruined the landscape. It's more like they fought a major battle or two each year with different peoples, spend a couple of years recouping their losses, and do lots of espionage and diplomacy but all while in a declared state of war against one another. This is where things start getting really dicey with using magic as technology. Kenneth suffers famine and starts using undead troops as a temporary measure that becomes permanent. This triggers a religious uprising in one of their enemy nations that causes a theocratic nation to splinter off from one of the original five nations. While later on back home the halflings of the Talenta say fuck it and secede from Kenneth. Saar gets it in the worst way. Big on magic but low on actual troops. Starts hiring mercenaries from the elves and goblinoids. The elves end up turning stag and fucking over Saar by creating a new elven nation and they get fucked over in the southwest by a resurging goblinoid nation trying to reclaim the glories of their ancestral empire. The druids of the western Eldine reaches get pissed about order not giving a fuck about them getting raped and murdered by roving armies of bandits and splinter off as well into a new nation. Berland gets it shitty too. A whole bunch of monsters led by three hags claim everything west of the Grey Wall Mountains, but thankfully barely anyone lived there. The aforementioned goblin country stole a chunk of their land for their border, and the gnomes decide to secede from Berlin and form their own little country. The gnomish bit wasn't too bad though, 
it was more of an official acknowledgement of the fact that the gnomes had been running their own affairs for centuries. The country is pretty much a vassal to Berland with very good relations in both directions. Berlin was so fuckhood before the war though that it's still the biggest and well off country afterwards. Refugees sick of war from all five nations flees to a colony. And the original has a pirates and smugglers basically play everyone and everything off against each other. During all of this, magic technology continues development. The gnomes, who also splinted off from Berlin, but under much more favorable conditions and terms to both sides steal the secrets of elemental binding from the Sula to Drow and Zendrik, and we're all sure that's never going to come back and bite them in the ass, no sir, and begin using those secrets to bind elementals to all kinds of shit. Then some crafty nut jobs realize if they use sawwood from their anal and big fucking elementals, they can push a ship faster over water. Then they realize they can do it right through the air as well. Creating the Baron airships which we all know and love for their fairly unique approach. In both design and concept. Forgotten Realms sort of copied the idea in the game Neverwinter during the Elemental Evil module when the Air Elemental forces used dirigibles empowered by Air Elementals. There's also levitating trains, self-powered sleds and wagons, etc. But then. House Caneth, who are the artificers and craftsmen of the setting, did something even more interesting. In Zendrik, they find these huge creation forges used to make the ancient quarry made warforged. They bring them back, tinker with them, and create the modern warforged as sentient living constructs. Aka Magi tech droids, they produce thousands for the war effort, and since they also already were making most of the weapons, armor, and other materials, they become war profiteers on a rather interesting scale. Who was at war with who shifted repeatedly throughout the conflict. At the time it ended, the following were at war. Under Kenneth. Unfriendly, but non-hostile to Sire. Berland. Sire Sire. Thrain. Berland. Kenneth Kenneth. Under Thrain. Sire Thrain. Sire. Kenneth the day of morning. One afternoon in mid-994. Sire just went up in a giant ball of mist. Sire was fighting a Berlin Thrain combined force for the past few days, near the town of Making, where there may have been some unusual research going on by House Kenneth. Sire. Or both. The Sirens were actually doing pretty good. They fought well against superior numbers and held ground to bring up reinforcements. On the afternoon of the second day, after they had fought to a standstill, that's when everything went to shit. A grey mist started emerging from the royal palace of Sire, moving to cover the capital city and, within the day the entirety of Sire. Those caught in the mist the first day died instantly, but those who entered the second day on would merely have difficulty healing within the mists in some places. Most buildings remain intact but some have been turned 90 degrees or found miles away. Making has become a giant, eternal lava sprout which cools into an obsidian mountain that keeps growing bigger. The mist stands to this day, cleanly marking the former borders of Sire. Indeed, the mist sends so cleanly at the end of Sire's land that a port city's docks are outside of the mists which led to several of the survivors. Inside the mists, the dead don't decay and in some places healing spells nor natural healing works on those not born within the Mornlands. Spells also came alive, literally, turning into a new type of creature called a living spell. Think about all these shitty spell combos you ever came up with on an optimization forum somewhere. Now take that awful combo and make it a creature that doesn't age, eat, or sleep and just continually attacks things on repeat until destroyed or otherwise subdued. But it wasn't just the living spells that were created that fucked things up. A massive number of its citizens just died. Crops withered to nothing. And all sorts of terrible mutations came about as a result of whatever rampant madness claimed the nation. Even years after that event. The land refuses to grow and any life that inhabits it suffers from the land sucking away any life. Corpses that died on the day of mourning still lie there, preserved by whatever awful power was unleashed. Life practically became uninhabitable, thus any survivors of that terrible event fled and the mournland is all that is left of that proud nation. There is no explanation for the day of mourning, not even an internal one. 
and with current policy never will be. The borders of the Mornland matching the borders of Sire suggests it was no random event. Popular and universe theories are someone's weapon going wrong. Alright. Overuse of magic. One of the planes deciding to turn Sire into a big ol' manifest zone and an overlord being unsealed. A popular out of universe theory is that Sire was actually taken by the mists into the demi plane of dread. Fifth edition's take on Ravenloft confirms that at least a small part of Sire, a lightning rail, was taken by the mists but leaves the fate of the rest of the country up in the air. After the war, the aftermath of the day of mourning proved just as horrific from another perspective. All of the Karen refugees were refused to settle in almost any of the surrounding nations. The Valinor elves, the mercenaries Sire brought in to help them, actually murdered the shit out of the few refugees who showed up. The other five nations mostly all felt that the morning was Sire's own fault. Only Berland eventually allowed them to form their own little refugee colony known as New Sire. Predictably, the Sirens have become a little grimdark about this and basically low-key hate everyone else for their treatment. Before anyone starts to chide them as emo, remember that the whole war started because three other nations refused to acknowledge Sire's leader's legitimate claim to the throne. They already hated the other nations pretty good, being treated like trash for the day of mourning has basically makes Sirens bitter and angry about everyone and everything. The terrible and unexplained event was enough to scare all the other nations into settling down for a diplomatic talk. These talks culminated in the drafting of the Treaty of Thronehold, a truce that effectively ended all the hostilities within Corvair. There are a few very interesting points of the treaty that bear looking at. Nation status. The treaty ended up recognizing all but a few of the existing nations as they are in the main Aberran book. Yes. The very notable exceptions were Drowem, whom everyone saw as a pack of fucking monsters anyway. Even the goblins of Dargon were better organized and in control of themselves. The Shadow Marches, but they weren't really an organized nation anyhow, which suited them just fine. And Sire, which was simply declared non-existent as of the Day of Mourning. Orndor squabbled about Eldeen being recognized, until Berland asked them about Old Berland. Territory Onda had seized from them first, and told Onda to stfu or lose even more territory. The Dragon marked houses. While the various houses already operated with some sanction in various capacities, the treaty certified some of it, specifically House Deneath being officially responsible for enforcing the terms of the treaty among various nations. Kanith got split in three factions when their leader went poof in the day of mourning, but aside from the internal politics, they're still the go-to guys for making shit. The other houses made out more or less like bandits. Their services were needed by everyone. And they suffered no real downside to being involved. Shit. They still had their unofficial headquarters down in Stormreach and Zendrick. The war did little or nothing harmful to them as individual houses or a unified whole. War forged. King Boronal's charisma at the negotiating table got emancipation for the war forged. Something that stuck in the craw of Thrain and a few others who felt that they owned those guys. They did. After all, pay for them. Current day. After the end of the last war most of the remaining nations are in an uneasy peace. Adventures in modern Aberran deal with cultists whose schemes threaten to send the nations back into war. If not nuked by the dragons again. Behind the scenes battles between factions vying for power. Which could also threaten to start another war. Or play detective thug and the massive cityscapes. Others raid the Mornlands to recover lost magic and contend with the growing cult of the Lord of Blades. Who some Warforge worship as their god who will eventually kill all meatbags. Some such adventurers are Warforged. But others have found ways around the restrictions on healing. Potions made inside function only inside the Mornlands. Good berry works. Psionic powers and other methods of healing that don't reference healing spells work implicitly, while quick trips to alternate dimensions also allow for healing. Others sidestep the problems with healing entirely and just don't adventure in the places in the Mornlands where healing is an issue, and have to contend with whatever environmental weirdness those areas of the Mornlands have. Others still raid the ruins of Zendrik. Either for archaeology or profit. Dragon marked. The one thing that stands out above all other things in a baron are the dragon marked. 
a dozen of the most powerful magically gifted houses that effectively act as the aristocracy for all Corvair. Each of the houses are identified by their particular magical tattoo-like marks on their skin and are the undisputed rulers of a particular trade. These marks also hold magical powers that permit their bearers to cast limited magic because of their power. Each house takes incredibly meticulous care to chronicle every single member of their bloodline, identifying their allegiances to the house, and how to best use them. In particular interest for these houses are the Sibri's dragon marks. Those individuals who have massive dragon marks that possess remarkable powers. Each house usually scrambles to ensure that they can count on these individuals. Occasionally house blood filters into the general popular through trysts, affairs, disowned members and other such occurrences. Those descended from these encounters can sometimes manifest a dragon mark in those that do are known as foundlings. Most Sibri's marked individuals are foundlings, as the mark almost only appears on those without prior dragon marks. Not all members of a house are dragon marked however. For most houses, non-dragon marked members are primarily for or by marriage. Denith allows any into its house. Though only humans married into the bloodline can have hereditary membership. Medony, humans and elves, and orine, half elves, half orcs, elves and orcs have significant membership outside of their primary species, though Medony prefers to keep the human elf ratio roughly even. Keeping the dragon marked houses in check is the core edicts. Agreements made with Galatha a thousand years ago. These edicts prohibit members from owning land. They must rent, intermarrying with noble families, and, with the exception of Denith, maintaining significant military forces beyond guards. Today the edicts are threatened by the fact that the nation these agreements were made with no longer exists and many likely violations were never addressed because of the war. In addition to the true marks, there are also aberrant marks said to be affiliated with Kyber, the dragon below. While true marks are linked to bloodline and can be reliably bred true, most aberrant marks occur seemingly at random outside of the mixed marks, identical to normal aberrant marks except they always have the color of true marks, spawned by mixing dragon marked bloodlines. In 5e, this unpredictably is such that while 3e aberrant marks were limited to the races that could have true marks, 5e allows any humanoid to have them. Note, Warforge are considered humanoids in 5e. Aberrant marks hold unique powers. 3e picked from a varied list, 4e had 3 particular categories to pick from 3 categories, while 5e allows any first level sorcerer a spell, but they are often unreliable while being dangerous to the user and those around them. This and safe nature was especially true during the distant past when aberrants were also far more powerful than today, with powers that included creating plagues they had no way to control or stop. This gave rise to the early 12 attempting to, and largely succeeding, exterminate aberrants, but the long disappearance of such marks and the weaker, less uncontrollable. Nature of modern aberrants means the modern 12 don't really care about them. The 12 still continue their agreement, separate from the core thedacids, to prohibit mixing of blood between the houses, so as to prevent the rise of mixed marks. The houses are the following. House Caneth, Mark of Making, originating in Sire. This house was the chief authority in all things artifice and manufacture. They made armor, wands, swords, and even war forged, and everyone wanted it. After the morning eradicated all house leadership, the remaining members have been attempting to group together and find a way to re-establish themselves. House Denith, Mark of Sentinel, your militant house. Denith focuses its business in the acquisition and contracting of various soldiers and is the only house allowed to maintain significant military forces. Since the core edicts forbids them from owning land. They are more like a giant house of knights errant. House Galanda, Mark of Hospitality, one of the two halfling-centric houses. These guys run all the inns and hotels as well as the variety of minor trades. This leads to them having plenty of friends. House Jurasco, Mark of Healing, the other halfling-centric house, 
made to be dedicated healers. They're renowned for their effectiveness to the point that they've sold their services to the highest bidder during the last war. Since even if high level clerics weren't rare neither the, the sovereign host or the church of the silver flame is big on resurrection and going to the dark six to get raised is a bad idea. They are best route for returning the dead to life. Unfortunately the magic alters that let them do that only do the 10,000 GP resurrection. So anyone looking for the half cost raised dead is out of luck. House Kundarak. Mark of Warding. The dwarf owned house focuses on security. Their main trade is banking where they can use their special magical locks and wards to ensure the utmost safety of their clients possessions. Their reliability has given them a friendship with Civis. House Lirinda. Mark of Storm. This half-elf run house once made a living ruling the seas, but with the introduction of manned flight, they began scouring the skies for opportunities. They've also been assisting the country of Valinor in the hopes of making it a home for the half-blooded. House Medany, Mark of Detection, mainly run by Brelish half-elves, this house has the finest inquisitives around by using their powers to detect things that usually go past others. They usually stay out of all the noble issues by working pro bono. House Orion, Mark of Passage. This house's main gig is the courier guilds by mean of their incredible nobility. Before Lirinda decided to shove elementals into ships, the Orion Courier's guilds and lightning rails were the only way to transport goods. While teleportation remained a luxury reserved to the super elite. Now they have contracts with Kanith in order to make more affordable teleportation. House Fielan. Mark of Shadow. The original elf centric shady house with a specialty in espionage with a front in entertainment. At some point near the end of the last war. A chunk of this house seceded and decided to become their own house. House Sivius. Mark of Scribing. The only gnome centric house and they focus entirely on the spoken and written word. Their claim to fame is the speaking stone. Magical telegraph. But their expertise stretches as far as guaranteeing the security of any messages they carry. They carry a particular alliance with Kundarak. Unlike the other houses. They rarely marry outside of the family and the only new blood is through introduction of foundlings. House Tarkanen. While not an official dragon marked house. This house does represent the aberrant dragon marks. Strange and possibly defective marks that have been known to cause madness and even death. And thus outcasts flock towards it. They have named themselves after Halas Tarkanen. A crazed warlord but organized resistance to the early 12's attempt to genocide aberrants during the War of the Mark. Despite its namesake and styling. House Tarkanen is essentially a glorified crime family. Though they would take the opportunity to challenge and disassemble the paradigms established by the main houses. House Therashk. Mark of Finding. Humans and half-orcs make the majority of this house. And with their dragon marks their senses sharpen to incredible levels to help identify whatever they hunt. While they may moonlight at monster hunting and tracking people. Their main business is prospecting or veins and dragon shit deposits. This house is actually the youngest of the dragon mark nobility. So they act the least snooty. House Thurani. Mark of Shadow. The other elf centered stealthy house. Though these guys specialize in being assassins. These guys aren't exactly bitter at Fielin and the two houses aren't hostile to each other. But they will get very competitive. House Vadlis. Mark of Handling. This human-led house specializes in the taming of animals of all sort, most notably their griffins, exemplified in a 4e paragon path that lets you ride a damn griffin around. That said, they are also in the business of breeding animals too, and some members even go so far as using magic to modify the brood in the pursuit of a better life form. Its members typically have arranged marriages and otherwise controlled lives, with the leaders breeding their human membership like they would animals. There was originally 13 dragon marks, but the house responsible for it did some terrible things worth getting killed over and it eventually caused a terrible chain of events that led to its destruction and its only survivor becoming a lich. More on that later moral flexibility. As mentioned before. A baron's a setting where morality is a lot more subjective when compared to a typical fantasy setting. Where certain species or religions are inevitably pigeonholed into certain stereotypes or absolute alignments. Monstrous races can find themselves as heroes. Humanoid races continue to sometimes be the real monsters. 
Supposedly benevolent religions can become oppressive and intolerant in the hands of men who believe they are serving the greater good, and apparently wicked faiths can be capable of valid points, have reasonably amicable goals, or have duped followers blind to the worse aspects of their religion. This led to a lot of diversity in interpreting the many facets of the setting. This meant that clerics didn't have to be stuck to the alignments of their faith especially in regards to the sovereign host and dark six whose members spread all across the alignment spectrum the nation of Broem is also a popular talking point revolving around trying to imagine all the monster races living together in a relatively functional if often somewhat evil society capable of diplomacy considering their bosses are witches probably the same way with chaos during a balam you never learn do you it also extends to npcs in other ways the benevolent neutral good queen of one of the nations after the war is plotting world domination under the reasonable grounds that she do a better job and stamp out all kinds of abuse from the worst run places on the continent while the vampire king of another is a champion of peace if only so his larder can remain undisturbed. Unique cosmology. If Baron formally struck itself away from the Great Wheel model, and whilst Keith Baker acknowledged players could set it within that multiverse if they really wanted to, the setting was built around a completely new set of planes and different ways of interacting between those planes. Whilst he never formally named his new cosmology, it picked up the nickname the Orrery for obvious reasons. Fifth edition decided to haul it back as part of its own great wheel, but never elaborated on how this works. Unlike older settings, reaching a baron from another campaign setting, or vice versa, is more limited than just casting plane shift a few times. The one method that has been presented explicitly in canonical material is the world serpent in, which connects even to the explicitly sealed off Aethus. A portal and sigil might allow accessing the setting. But the only plan escape support after Iberon's introduction is expedition to the Demonweb pits, which is mum on Iberon outside of the monster section having an inner Baron section for each monster. Dungeons and Dragons Online, set in Iberon but with several blatant cannon breaks like Stormreach having a substantial presence of non-heretical silver flame. Uses a foreign deity and an overlord cooperating to open a rift between their two worlds. Later DDO content has the gatekeepers able to casually open portals to Greyhawk. Never explicitly identified as such. But the content is based on classic modules from the setting and you outright meet Qual in one of them. Which they say is on the same material plane, but very far away. A licensed Forgotten Realms based idle game, of all things, features a Warforge allied with the Elder Evil Hader that has somehow bridged the gap, implicitly by space travel. Toral still works with Spelljammer's principles since even if this hasn't been mentioned for three editions, nothing has refuted it either, and Iberon's author has said Spelljammer's could traverse to Iberon if someone wanted to. It's up to the PCS. Other settings are home to Oppa's fuck NPCs that could solve all the problems instantly if they weren't hand wild away by being busy or needing to maintain some kind of balance to avoid letting good win too much. In Ibaran, friendly higher level NPCs are rare and have low mobility. The Lollipop loses most of her power if she leaves Flammerkeep. The max level druid is an awakened but mostly stationary tree and the undying court can't leave their manifest zone. The five nations have plenty of soldiers and champions who could help, if they aren't against you, but would provoke another war if they moved in earnest. In the end, you are the setting's champion, and you can become more powerful than any of the above. Mysteries without answers. To give the dungeon master room to work with, Iberon is home to several mysteries that have no canonical answer. The most prominent among these are what the cause of the morning was, the true identity of the Lord of Blades, what the Mark of Death actually did or does, the nature of the Divine, and what, if anything, comes after Dollar. New Races, Changeling, Doppelganger ancestry means that these guys can change their appearance at will and have minor telepathy. That manifests as social skill bonuses. Balance because they can't change their clothes when they shapeshift. Kalashta. Human bodies. 
psionic outsider souls, natural telepaths effectively indistinguishable from humans, loves martial arts and fighting secret wars against evil dream spirits, shifter, where attached humanoids that can temporarily shift to adopt animal characteristics, not descended from specific were creatures, war forged, PC appropriate robots golems, created to fight in the last war, now, mostly, liberated to live their own lives, can attach magical items to their bodies. Furthermore, a baron was built with the expectation that goblinoids and orcs are members of society, so they have been integrated well. Drow are organized into multiple tribes that can have vastly different relations to outsiders and plenty of exiles besides. Iberon is urbanized and industrialized enough that even stranger species can be found in large cities without bloodshed or the populace freaking out. This is all aided by Iberon scraping typical alignment on pretty much every natural, non-outsider, intelligent creature in favor of creating conflict through nationalism and occasionally religion. New classes. Artificer. PC class better at making and utilizing magic items, often accompanied by homunculi, costs infusions instead of spells. Infusion list is mostly buff debuff effects that are cast on equipment, or constructs, rather than creatures. Majorite, NPC class, basically an expert with very limited spell casting ability, fulfills the role of wage wizards in the setting. 13-1 An unusually high percentage of Iberon revolves around having 13 of something, with one of them lost or destroyed. Read. A baker's dozen. There were 13 moons alternate planes, but one had its connection severed. There were 13 marks. But one was wiped out. There are 13 regions in the modern Corvair, but one is the Mornland. There's 13 holidays, but people ignore one. Workaholics a lot of them. There's even 13 kinds of halfling tea, called Tau. And the knowledge of making one of them was lost in the Zoriat incursion. For DDO players who did the Shroud. 13th Eclipse anyone done. That's exactly the reason for the imbalance that caused the invasion. Baker himself has stated that they just independently set two things in groups of 13-1 and thought it would be cool to run with it. Keith Baker didn't even notice the obvious Baker's dozen pun until someone pointed it out to him. Manifest zones. In unpredictable parts of the world, the other planes of Iberon bleed into the prime material and change fundamental laws of physics. Often these are temporary, though the duration is generally as unpredictable as always but many are permanent. In most settings, this kind of thing is treated as a novelty, or a hazard. In a barren, these are considered natural resources to be exploited. Shan, the world's largest city and the only one built vertically, is built on a manifest zone to Serenia. If that zone were severed, the city would fall like Wiley. Coyote upon suddenly remembering gravity was a thing. 5th edition. For the longest time, a baron went untouched in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Outside of an early released unearthed arcana conversion document of dubious quality. That all changed on the 23rd of July 2018. When Wadk announced that they were allowing Keith Baker to produce his own translation of a baron to 5e. A document called the Wayfinder's Guide to Iberon on the DM's Guild. This was described as a first step with the Wayfinder's Guide being described as a singular point to collect feedback on adjusted races, dragon marks, new backgrounds and more. The implication by hope here is that what will release their own fully official printed copy of a 5e Iberon based on the feedback given to Keith Baker's test book. The fanbase was split on this decision. On the one hand, the fact Iberon was finally returning was a source of celebration, especially among players who were sick of many of the prior material being focused on the Forgotten Realms. On the other hand, the fact that the first Iberon book was basically a glorified homebrew, and one that you were paying $20 for to boot, and which will probably get obsoleted by a more expensive book later, was a source of outrage. Especially given the simultaneous announcement that Ravnica was going to get its own campaign setting book. Still, this decision meant it was finally legal for fans to put their own aberrant base content on the DM's guild. And the unearthed arcana for several months afterward presented the various aspects for anyone to use. Races. Dragon marked as subraces. 
and magic items. In late August 2019, Baron's official 5th edition debut was announced with a Baron. Rising from the Last War, coming out on the 19th of November. Among the many inclusions of the book is the final, retweaked version of the Artificer for 5th edition, as well as ways to run around in the Mornland. If you really want to do that sort of thing, they also tease a new feature called Group Patrons which acts as a background. But for your entire adventuring party, one oddity with the book is that the cover was swapped a mere week before starting printing on account of the original cover being completely and utterly horrible and getting backlash for it. The original cover consisted of nothing more than a twink looking elf gnome hybrid on a blue background with a badly drawn warforged in front of him. The new cover is clearly a rush job. Yet miles better in that it actually depicts something that's about a baron, showing a better drawn warforge with a clearly tribal halfling, and his dinosaur companion but that is sadly cut off by the aspect ratio and only visible on the banner version. Even though there's dead space this dinosaur could have easily been moved to if it wasn't a rush job. If you don't like either of them, you can get the alternate cover, which is amazing, featuring a stylized frame and title encircling the spires of Shan in a skyship against an aberrant night sky. Keith Baker presents. Keith Baker has also released his own homemade splat books through Wizards and Guild service under the brand KB Presents. They are technically not official products, but, much like the theoretical case of George Lucas publishing Star Wars fan fiction after selling the franchise to Disney, it's close enough that most fans treat it as an official expansion. And Wizards isn't quite stupid enough to say anything one way or another about it. The books are Exploring a Baron, which details various corners of the setting that were mostly glossed over in official material in the past, such as the various planes. Also includes several player options, including new subclasses, a playable null race, and racial feats for a Baron specific races. Dread Metral which imagines the capital city of Sire as a demiplane of dread, though it still leaves the fate of the rest of Sire and the cause of the morning up in the air. Frontiers of a Baron Threshold, which focuses on the Old West-styled region surrounding the Berlin-Drohen border.